Heavenly Father, God, thank you for a sweet opportunity, Lord, to be able to be together, to meet as a body, Lord, to praise you for what you have done in the gospel, saving us, Lord. Lord, I pray that our time now in equipping our looking specifically at church planting and languages and just an update uh, from our family, Lord, would be edifying and a joy for everybody to hear. I pray, Lord, you would continue to raise up more and more workers, laborers, Lord, that would desire to labor in the fields of Papua New Guinea. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, many of you know me. Uh, for those that don't, my name is Jeremy Lehman, and uh, I work for Finister Vision, overseeing its administrative needs and as well as recruitment and helping with missionary training. And Finister Vision, just as a, an overview, I know lots of us know this, but we're a parachurch organization. So we work alongside local churches desiring to send their church planting missionaries to Papua New Guinea. Uh, Joel James has said that missions is the church with the passport, and we come alongside in that process, providing the entry visa for the passport to legally enter and stay in the country. We also make sure through training that the right tools are in the bags of those missionaries before departing, and we provide the administrative structure to handle finances, government compliance, and logistical support while they're on the field. So just with that, before I dive into a bunch of other things, I want to recommend a book to you guys. All the kids in the room will appreciate this. Okay, does that look fun to read? Adults, you guys can say it looks fun too. It's okay. So this is a book that was put together by a New Tribes family, and they wrote a book that basically takes what indigenous church planting ministry looks like and put it into the context of a kid's story about turtles and rabbits and raccoons. So I've given this to Omri. I think at some point it'll make its way on into the uh, book table, but for now it'll be sitting on the missions table in the back. We'll put it there at the end of the service. But I'd encourage you guys to take a peek at it, consider getting it for your kids. They'll learn a bunch. Uh, you'll learn a bunch too, I think, as well. So book recommendation for everyone. Um, something I noticed after choosing the title for this equipping hour that is I, uh, I bit off far more than I could chew, uh, the idea of getting through language, logistics, and uh, strategic locations at Papua New Guinea in one hour is nearly impossible. So what I'm going to do is give an update on our family. Uh, what did we do in Papua New Guinea? What are we doing now that we're back? I um, also want to give you guys just things that we learned, a big list of fun exciting, goofy, silly, and real things we learned while we were in Papua New Guinea. And then specifically look at languages in Papua New Guinea. We'll be looking at Medang Town, we'll be looking at uh, what that looks like in a village context, and we'll give ourselves a biblical understanding of languages, categories of languages in the Bible when the gospel spread all throughout the Roman Empire. So for me, my name is Jeremy, my wife is Lori, and we have Greer and Bella Knox all sitting over there. Uh, we have been members of Grace Bible since 2010, sent out as missionaries in 2014, along with the Cans and the Dodds. And what we did in Papua New Guinea, our role in that team was taking care of logistical and administrative needs. Now, we had to establish the organization in the country of Papua New Guinea. It didn't exist. We had to set up a foreign bank account so we could fund the organization's needs in Papua New Guinea. We had to build relationships with other missionary organizations already established in Papua New Guinea. I had to purchase a vehicle for the organization, I had to purchase freezers and refrigerators and other things to be able to organize an effective supply strategy. Helping the teams purchase, test, move, and transport supplies needed for church planting among a remote people in the jungle. When we moved back to the States in 2020, our original plan before we left was to be in Papua New Guinea for three years. And the goal was set the organization up in the country and get a smooth running logistical machine and then pass those keys off to the next person that would be able to take over that role. And our desire coming back was to be able to step into seminary training for myself, to step into uh, a business manager role for Finister Vision, overseeing administrative needs, and then really just wanting to be back with the body here uh, at Grace Bible Church. So we knew that we would be able to get to Papua New Guinea and with the skill set, uh, be able to set everything up, but didn't see ourselves as a long-term individual to stay in that role. And so coming back to the States was something that we had planned for 
uh, from the very beginning. Um, when we got back to the States, uh, COVID was happening. So we uh, got back in, uh, back into February 2020, and uh, that was as soon as the lockdowns were starting. So we finished a very brief trip looking at seeing all of Lori's family in the Northwest. As soon as we got back, things were starting to shut down in each of those states, beginning in Washington, moving to Oregon, and then California. And so when we got back into our rental house, uh, to which all of our small group, the Kelso, Josh Kelso small group, uh, they all had basically gone and grabbed all of our items out of storage and put them all in the house. So when we got back, everything was already moved in. We had been so well cared for. And they even had a bundle of toilet paper because we we're in the middle of uh, COVID toilet paper uh, lockdown. And so we had prayed, just asking for the Lord to be able to care for us in our transition back to the States. We knew that our time coming back to the States would really end up with a filled calendar. Um, we knew that as soon as we get back, there'd be so many people we want to spend time with. Um, and living in Papua New Guinea, we really spent just a tremendous amount of time with one another. In the evening, everything shuts down. You're in your house. The fence is locked. Um, you're really just around yourselves all the time, which is very sweet. And so we didn't know what that was going to look like. So we didn't realize that our prayers would turn into a COVID lockdown for the whole world. Um, but we were really thankful that the Lord used that to allow us to transition back uh, the way we needed to. Uh, currently, um, I am in my second year at TES, uh, wrapping that up. Finals will be next week, which is going to be sweet. Uh, we are serving in uh, student ministries right now and just desiring to see the young men and young women in this church uh, love Christ and desire to pursue him and know him. Um, overseeing business-related tasks for fitness or vision, like I said, but then also stepping into helping with recruitment and also with missionary training. And Lori continues to be my continual encourager, my faithful wife, uh, my homeschool, uh, at homeschool teacher, faithful mother, caring for our kids, and really it's just proved to be an asset, even thinking through training future families to go to Papua New Guinea. What are the things they're going to feel, things they need to deal with, things they need to be trained for before they go to the field to be able to be successful? And so just in summary, thank you, Grace Bible Church, for your key role in just caring for our family as we've come back to the States. We were sent well, we've come back and transitioned well, and we are still serving in a capacity with fitness or vision, and Grace Bible plays a instrumental role in those things. So thank you so much. The next thing I'm gonna do is go through a list of things that we learned in Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is a, a long list, but I think succinct sentences uh, will give you guys just a picture of things that we dealt with there. We learned how to drive on the left side or the wrong side of the road with a manual transition. Learned that thievery is a common thing after our car was broken into more than 10 times over a five-year period. Learned that power, water, and internet access are not as reliable as I once thought. Learned that being courteous while driving was a great way to get nowhere. Learned that just because a car has a set number of seats does not mean that's a limit on the number of people you can shove inside it. Learned that dodging potholes, pigs, and people while driving is business as usual. Learned that kids like traveling back and forth from Papua New Guinea because of the in-flight movies. Learned that a package sent to P&G from the States would turn into rat food if we did not pick it up quickly. Learned that the largest mission base in the world in, is in Papua New Guinea, belongs to SIL, and has a Willy Wonka kind of name to it, Ukarumpa. Learned that we are dependent on airplanes, helicopters, flown by other mission organizations to transport people, food, and supplies into a village. Learned that one kilogram weighs 2.2 pounds. Learned while traveling that the word close to, which means close, could mean five minutes or it could mean five hours. Also learned that yumikam pinis means we are here. But that can also mean we are really here or we still have an indiscriminate period of time before we arrive. Learned that making a 10-hour hike from Maui Roro to the coast in the middle of dry season was not wise. Mad Dodd had to drink water from a puddle on the ground. Learned that there is no Amazon distribution center in Papua New Guinea. Learned that items sent in the mail take at least eight weeks to get to the post office in Medang. Learn the foreign language to talk pisin, which my wife says is not part of the romance languages. Learn that come back tomorrow was a polite way to indicate that the person was unable to help you with your request. 
Learn that neighbors sometimes think playing the radio and talking on a megaphone is a good idea at two o'clock in the morning. Learn the polite way of dismiss, dismissing a guest as saying, thank you for coming, you can leave us now. Learn if I ever heard the term kalaman, which means bald guy, or the term white man, I should probably see if someone was addressing me. Learn that books and Bibles can grow mold on them even when they are regularly used. Learn that Coke goes a long way in forming a, re a relationship. Learn that getting into line and who came first are not firm concepts for most. Learn that trying to open a bank account in the middle of talk, piss, and learning uh, was quite an experience. Learn that when you show up at a store full of security guards, that is normal and expected. Also learn that just because there are security guards does not mean they will do anything when a large threat shows up. Learn that when a person sends someone some coins, they do not mean loose change, they mean a chunk of money. Learn that just existing in Papua New Guinea takes more time than it does to exist here. Learn that submitting a document without knowing anyone at the office was, a useful, was as useful as placing the form in the trash. Learn that the police would love to come help when there's a problem, but they're apparently always in need of fuel money every time you ask. Learn that seeing a dude with a machete actually meant gardening rather than pillaging. Learned it was perfectly normal to have hundreds of people just hanging around in town and leaning against buildings. Learned that understanding the trade language, talk pissin, can be impacted by where someone is from and by just how much betel nut they happen to have sloshing around in their mouth at the time. Learned that death is more real and evident in daily life than it is here. Learned that there is nothing weird about selling coffins on the side of the road leading to town. Learned that burning your garbage is a thing, and everyone over there is doing it. Learned that rain at night creates a sweet symphony on a metal roof. Learned that that same rain becomes a distraction for thieves to break in unnoticed. Learned there is a big difference between the word peck peck and pook pook. One is the term for crocodile, the other is a term associated with potty talk. I'll let you choose which word means what, just don't mess it up. Learn that when people give you things, it carries the expectation that you would repay that give in the future. Learn that they believe peace at all costs should be valued even over what is just. On occasions, I had seen the police require that victims of assault pay compensation to their aggressor to keep the peace. Learn there are many missionaries in Papua New Guinea with many different views on how missions should be done. Learn that there are Mormon Papua New Guineans in Medang Town, complete with white shirts and name tags. Learn that there are at least two Papua New Guinean monks with shaved heads and a robe to match. Learn that a t-shirt, board shorts, and flip-flops are acceptable choices of clothing for a business meeting. Learn that after someone learns the names of my children, Lori and I would no longer be called by our names. We would be the father and mother of such and such child. Learn that when your P&G male buddy holds your hand, you just embrace it for what it is, a warm sign of a true friendship. Learn that sitting with a friend does not always necessitate talking. Such events were common and expected. A true friend is comfortable being with you even if you have nothing to say. Learn the best way to fall asleep in the heat was to take a shower literally right before bed and fall asleep under a fast moving fan. Learn that people often say yes and actually mean I have no idea what you're talking about. Learn that ability to speak another language does not necessarily mean proficiency in the language. We learned to snorkel, to free dive, to spearfish on a reef. Learned how to catch crabs, lobster, mantis shrimp, squid, octopus, stonefish, and reef fish. Learn that the ocean reefs in P&G are lush with countless shapes and colors of coral, sea cucumbers, sea turtles, cowfish, lionfish, stingrays, moray eels, starfish, and sea urchins. Learn how to play P&G street hockey with neighborhood kids using a round puck cut out of an old flip-flop and a stick from the nearest tree. Also learn that rather than letting the puck lay flat, Kids hit the puck back and forth, causing it to roll, 
If the rolling puck is not hit before it falls flat, then the team hitting the puck gets the point. Learned that our kids enjoyed eating ice cream that ironically did not have milk as an ingredient listed on the container. Learned that our 40-foot mango tree with branches full of ripe fruit overhanging our galvanized metal roof results in loud mango bomb explosions in the middle of the night. Learned how to eat strange fruit. Soursop, which looks like a spiny green dinosaur egg. Rabutan, passion fruit, sugar fruit, star fruit, sugar cane, purple skin bananas, chubby bananas, normal bananas, plantain bananas, papayas, and mangoes. Learn that you can purchase sharks from the fish market. An 18-inch hammerhead and a white tip reef shark apparently cost just $2. Learn that my young boys could turn those sharks into dead action figures and battle one another with their jaws wide open. Learn that young coconut water is amazing, and depending on the color of the husk before the coconut is opened, the water inside will be naturally carbonated. Learn that the grocery store sells hot cinnamon and sugar donuts in the morning. Learn that just because the grocery store has a block of cheese covered with mold and wet from a power outage does not mean necessarily that it should be thrown away or discounted. Learned that a fire-roasted octopus tentacle was not as tasty as I thought it would be. Learned that enjoying organic market produce came with lots of organic bugs that were living in and on it. Learned that geckos chirp like birds, which is cute at first until you want to go to bed in the cacophony of noises. Learned that crabs will sometimes walk right into your house through your front door. Learned that rats like to live in the thatching of village houses. Also learned that often when you're sleeping, they will slip while running across a roof beam, making you the object that cushions their fall. Learned that white maggots can jump about two feet in the air. Really. They really can. Learned that glass ants are big and orange, build bridges by locking their bodies together, will stop in their tracks to stare at you if you get too close and bite anyone along their path. Learned that any bird or flying fox landing in a tree becomes an immediate target of a slingshot. Learned that death adders are real snakes, and should you ever be opening a faucet on a water tank in the middle of the night, with no headlamp, while observing a dark moving stick passing by your hand, don't move. That would have been a quick end to a long house building survey trip. Learn that ants seem to be able to smell food even before it's cooked. Armies of them would regularly make their entrance into the kitchen for a taste. Learned how to treat malaria three times. Learned how to troubleshoot our own medical issues. Learned how to give IVs to two different dogs that were severely hydrated. Learn that it's possible to get Girardia more than once and that it's treatable. Learn that when a hacksaw blade breaks, it can impale your hand. Learn that you can close up a large head wound with sterile strips. Learn you can wait a few days before getting a broken arm casted. Learn that quantity of work and diligence in your work are two different things. Learn that you can sing to the Lord and praise him and talk pissing. Learned that the talk piss and Bible called the book Bible in the hands of a faithful teacher has clarity. Learned to keep a closer eye on our kids after church service, after finding Knox chasing a chicken with an ax raised over his head. Learned that we own far too much and even giving things away to people made them embarrassed by how much they received. Learned that the same issues that plague the heart of man here plague the heart of man over there. Learn that Papua New Guineans are very hospitable. And learn that Papua New Guineans love children, want to hold them, and give them things. The Lord taught us a tremendous amount in Papua New Guinea. We grew, uh, we learned things that we would not have learned otherwise if we had not been placed in such a situation. Uh, we were stretched in ways we needed to be stretched. Um, and the Lord used that and that experience and that time there really to teach us things that would allow us just to be individuals who are more effective at loving the Lord and loving others. So as we move away from things we learned in P&G, what is our family up to now? Uh, we can pull out our Bibles now. And I want us to look at categories of languages that we find in the New Testament. As the gospel spread out from Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, uh, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 
It says, but you disciples will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so I want you guys to turn is chapter two. We're going to start in verse four. And just, I want us to be thinking through the categories of languages that we find in the book of Acts as the gospel is spreading its way from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Uh, and how do those categories of languages that we find in the New Testament, what does that look like in terms of it coming close to what the categories of languages look like in Papua New Guinea? Uh, there is a lot of crossover. It doesn't mean it's equal and a one for one, but it means there is crossover in terms of the language interaction we find in the New Testament, the individuals and what languages they spoke as Paul went in his missionary endeavors. We find similarity in between that as we think about Papua New Guinea. And so we're going to look at that together. So I will open up my Bible and we will start at verse 4. And again, just giving context, the Holy Spirit has just come. Uh, the disciples have been given miraculous gifts of speaking other languages they have not learned. And the result of that is that there is a crowd that gathers to listen. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says, and they, the disciples, were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And so here we have a group of Jews who are residing in Jerusalem because of Pentecost. Luke lists that they come from areas all over the known world at that time. And notice what is being said by these Jews who are hearing this miraculous event. The second half of verse 7 says, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Verse 8 and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Now, if you're reading from the New American Standard, the NASB, it says our own language to which we were born. Own language or native language could also be rendered as dialect. Uh, the Greek word here is dialectos. And so we derive the word dialect from that Greek word. Now watch this. These Jews are listening to what is being said by the disciples in their native language. And at the same time, they are speaking to one another about what they are individually experiencing. These individuals who are saying they individually have their own native language are speaking to others in the crowd with a different native language. It follows that they are using a shared language to do so. Well, Luke records next is Peter's speech to the crowd who's gathered. It's now time for Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, to be Christ's witness to those in Jerusalem and Judea. You know, just pan down to verse 14. It says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Stop there, just wanting to give clarity to what he's, what he's communicating. Notice that them is what it says. He addressed this group. It even goes on to categorize the group he is speaking to, men of Judea or Jerusalem dwellers. Now, remember, the event of speaking in different languages prompted this group to gather and listen to Peter speaking to all of them. It seems obvious he's speaking a single language rather than multiple languages out of one mouth that would be understood by them all. Their language, their native language or dialect is, again, it's affirmed in verse 7 and 8, but the shared language understood by all is sufficient for this crowd to hear and understand Peter's proclamation of the gospel to them. Let's look at their response in verse 37. It 
It says, now when they, this crowd that had gathered, when they heard this, that's the preaching, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Here you have a response that indicates they understood the teaching. And the Holy Spirit used that teaching given to the whole group to bring conviction of sin, repentance, and immediate obedience, not only to believe Christ, but to be publicly identified with him. And although Luke does not name the shared language that Peter spoke in, we can affirm that it was understood. As the gospel began moving from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, it would have been communicated in the language of Koine Greek. Uh, this is the same language to which the entire New Testament was written. The shared language would have been spoken in the land of Israel by many, but even more broadly, in every place that dust collected on Paul's sandals. Listen to this summary of Koine Greek during this period of history given by Bill Mounts. Athens was conquered in the 4th century BC by King Philip of Macedonia. Alexander the Great, Philip's son, was tutored by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Alexander set out to conquer the world and spread Greek culture and language. Because he spoke Attic Greek, it was this dialect that was spread. It was also the dialect spoken by the famous Athenian writers. This was the beginning of the Hellenistic age. But as the Greek language spread across the world and met other languages, it was altered, which is true of any language. The dialect also interacted with others, and eventually this adaptation resulted in what today we call Koine Greek. Koine simply means common and describes the common everyday form of the language used by everyday people. Studies of Greek papyri found in Egypt over the last 100 years have shown that this language was the language of the everyday people, used in writings of wills, private letters, receipts, shopping lists, etc. Now, I'm still quoting him. There are two lessons that we can learn from this. As Paul says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, Galatians 4.4, 4, and part of that fullness was a universal language. No matter where Paul traveled, he could be understood. Now, in light of that quote and understanding the widespread use of Koine Greek in Paul's day, let's take a look at some particular examples of language during Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. The same pattern of comprehension, while not naming the language, can be spoken. It continues through the account of Paul's ministry. Turn over to Acts 14, 1 through 7. Acts 14, 1 through 7. Now, just summarizing, I'm going to read through this. Well, I'll just read. Now, in Iconium, they entered together. This is both Par, Paul, and Barnabas. They entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Look back at verse 1. One of the things that Luke seems like he just assumes that the reader will come to is that there is comprehension. Uh, now at Iconium, they entered together, verse 1, into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Um, you have the gospel message being proclaimed, and you have understanding as a result of that message being proclaimed. There is a shared language here that allows individuals coming from different backgrounds with different native languages to be able to comprehend the message that the missionary is bringing to them. What's interesting is pan down just a little bit further as he moves into Lystra, starting at verse 8. Here's a contrast that Luke provides naming a specific native language uh, that brings some confusion. Now, at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. 
He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. He sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he has allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. It's interesting in this account, Luke draws a very clear distinction that Paul, who's preaching in the beginning prior to him healing this man, as a result of the healing, the people cry out in a different language. Uh, he draws clarity to the fact that he's speaking in the dialect of Lystra, Lyconium. And it seems as though both Paul and Barnabas are confused about the activities that are happening around them. And when they do find out, they rush in and they speak to the crowd. But the speaking that they give to the crowd is sufficient for the crowd to stop, even if they barely restrain them. Luke draws a distinction. He knows how to do this, to draw a distinction between a native language when it is spoken, as opposed to a shared language that is assumed in the proclamation of the gospel. You see this assumption of understanding based on a shared language uh, when you look at the accounts of Paul and all of his missionary journeys. He doesn't draw a distinction to a native language. Uh, it's just assumed. And you see this. I'll just name some of these. Acts 16, 16.14, 16.31, 17.4, 17.11, 17.34, 18.8, 19.9, 20.18. There's no naming of the language. There is only the assumption of comprehension, and there is comprehension and faith and belief. When he makes the exceptions, like we find here in Lystra, he also makes an exception in another item or another area. In Acts 21, verse 40, um, and in 22, 2, you can turn there if you would like, but I'm just going to summarize it. Paul has made his way back to Jerusalem. He finds himself in the temple. And there is a mob that comes after him with a desire to mistreat him. Uh, there is a Roman centurion that is there that grabs Paul, protects him from the mob. They were able to calm the mob down. And then Paul asks if he is able to speak, uh, to which he does. When he goes to address the crowd in 21 verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 40, it says that he addresses the crowd in Hebrew or in the Hebrew language. And then it also says in 22, 2, that when the crowd heard that he was speaking in the native language of Hebrew, that they listened and they grew quiet. And so God knows how to draw a distinction, and Luke knows how to draw a distinction, in between a native language being spoken and an assumed language or a shared language being spoken. He assumes that the reader will understand that everywhere the gospel went, people were able to understand it. A final consideration that goes back to Bill Mounce's quote in the New Testament canon itself. God preserved the entire canon of the New Testament in Koine Greek. Uh, Lori and I were laughing about even the, uh, the book of Hebrews. Written to Hebrews is written in Koine Greek as opposed to being written in Hebrew. And so we see God preserving in this way, regardless of which group a person was in, God preserved the New Testament and the revelation of his son in the common language of the day with the expectation that it would be heard and believed. And so now that we just have some biblical categories to think through in terms of types of languages, both a shared language and a native language, I want us to pivot to the context of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea could broadly be categorized as having uh, two shared languages, um, and a staggering number of native languages. Uh, under the banner of shared languages uh, would be English and Tokpisin. 
English is named as one of the national languages in Papua New Guinea. It's a language used by the more educated group of society. It's a language you see in national newspapers, spoken by in the international business community and also by politicians. It's a language that allows PNG to connect and engage in the outside world. However, at this present time, it is the minority shared language in Papua New Guinea. The dominant shared language is Tokpisin, which developed out of regional dialects or native languages coming into contact with the outside world. On the majority, the language uses English words, and all the grammar students will love this summary. You ready? Okay. Talk Pisson utilizes a reduced grammar, a lack of copula, determiners, a reduced set of prepositions and conjunctions. Did you get that? Okay. So in other words, it's a very simple language with limited vocabulary and tremendous flexibility. If you're like me, a word picture will help capture this. The Oxford English Dictionary has a total of 21,728 pages contained in 20 volumes and weighs 144.8 pounds. The Oxford Talk Pisson Dictionary is this single 360 page pocket volume weighing in at an impressive eight ounces. And of this volume, half of it is English to talk piss and the other half is uh, the other direction. This is 124 pages and that's actually the dictionary for the language. And so when you think of scope of language reduced down to flexibility in a language, talk pissing is very flexible. Um, and it must be. We can circle back to talk pissing in a moment, but just to summarize, I want to mention the final group of languages in Papua New Guinea. That last group of languages are the individual dialects, or to use our pattern term, native languages. The Cans and the Mitchells are ministering to people who speak the Doe language, and Zach Can is planning to teach next week's equipping hour on translation into the Doe language. And so I'm eagerly anticipating that and I think that he will provide far more clarity on native languages than I will be able to do uh, from here. Just to give some stats at the risk of sounding redundant, as of 2009, from the Bible Translation Association in Papua New Guinea, over 800 different spoken languages are in Papua New Guinea. 261 translations of the Bible or portions of the New Testament uh, have been translated. 25 of those are accessed in audio format and two in video format. Now, 800 languages, if we take that and just look at how many languages are in Medang province, that would be kind of like thinking about the state of Arizona or maybe thinking about a zip code. 172 of those 800 languages are found in Medang province alone. And so that's an area slightly larger than Maricopa County. These languages are complex. They contain far more words and phrases that allow for greater precision. I asked Zach to give a brief summary on native languages, which he will probably expound more next week. I said this, Do, which is a native language, naturally informs and adheres to the thinking and worldview of its speakers. This means each native language will do the same for each group of people who speak it, making it critical to understand the culture as well as the language to communicate the gospel with clarity to each group. So now that we've categorized native languages and we're thinking about shared languages in Papua New Guinea, I want us to spend the rest of the time just looking at ministry in Medang Town utilizing Tok Pisin. Something that we immediately experience getting to Papua New Guinea and interacting in the shared trade language of Tok Pisin is that you see signs and advertisements in Tok Pisin as well as signs in English. There's also signs that will be a blending of the two with New Guinean as well as uh, English, which they affectionately call Pinglish. Uh, they'll say, we don't speak English, and we don't speak Tokpisin, but some people speak Pinglish, and so it's somewhere in the middle. I've heard Tokpisin used by children in town all the way up to members of parliament. Just recently, I listened to the chair, or one of the chairs of parliament addressing the speaker of parliament in English, peppered with Tokpisin. There's a sense of a national identity for a New Guinean that's wrapped up in Tokpisin. And what's so shocking for me first was learning its flexibility. Uh, there's not many words to learn, and by contrast to English, yet you're able to communicate with clarity as long as both parties understand the context. Just an example, 
Uh, there's a preposition in Torkpisan uh, called long, L-O-N-G, which sounds simple enough, but it can be used in a ridiculous number of contexts. So remember, a preposition is everything a squirrel can do with his tree or a frog can do with his log, right? Around it, on top of it, next to it. So here's the definition of everything that that one preposition can mean. It can mean in, on, at, to, from, with, by, about, because of, during, or according to. Also used in a supporting preposition to mean on top of, over, above, beside, in front of, after, below, towards, until, or approach. And it also helps with location questions like wherever, where, or how. So when a technical term in this language is lacking, a descriptive phrase will be used. So an example would be a cardiologist. There's no such word in talk pissing for a cardiologist um, as a one word for one word equivalent. Rather, talk pissing's limited words and elasticity requires that you describe the word to come to clarity. So you'd say something like, Dispelakain daka imaki mumpala work tassol. Emi work belong all right team clock belong memory tassol. This kind of doctor has chosen only one type of work, and that work is related to fixing people's hearts. Again, this doesn't mean that there can't be clarity. However, it does mean that it often requires more words to come to clarity. Another factor that goes hand in hand with coming to clarity is a worldview culture informing the language and informing the individual. Even in the example above, clock can also be swapped out and changed for the word lewa, which really means liver which would be the center of where an individual's emotions are and things of that nature. But it's also a word that can be associated with sorcery in Papua New Guinea. So someone could easily hear me talking about a doctor, a cardiologist specifically, and think I'm speaking about a sorcery practice. Context is king, and so understanding which words and phrases have intersection with animistic worldviews must be grasped, and ways to mitigate it have to be employed. This isn't uncommon even in English. Um, let's consider the word justified and its different uses and its different forms. Romans 3.28 says this, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Romans 4.5 says, And to the one who does not work to be justified, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, Scripture is clear. Justification is a declaration of righteousness. Justification is that which comes behind where a believer is progressively sanctified to be more and more like Christ. But that term, justification, is also used by the Roman Catholic Church, by Christian Scientologists, and by Mormons. But that doesn't mean, however, that I shy away from that term when sharing the gospel with those individuals. It means I have to spend the time to come to clarity to overcome the worldview that that person has as they're coming to that text and defining that word. It also does not mean that Tarkpisan, coming back to it, does not have clarity because of his limitations. Again, there's a need to understand the worldview. I've had some people ask me if you can navigate your way through Medang by just using English rather than talk pisan. The English used in town is influenced by Australia, New Zealand, as well as talk pisan word order. And so for those with a lower education, their English sounds more like a mix of both English and talk pisan. Remember that word, Pinglish, right? So while those of a higher education tend to lose the talk pisan word order and phrasing, allowing them to sound more like a natural English speaker. Even with some individuals having greater proficiency in English, um, I found that 99% of the time I conversed with people in talk pisan rather than English. I remember when my parents visited our family while we lived in Medang back in 2017. Sunday morning, we showed up at the local church that we were a part of. The pastor comes over to introduce himself to my parents. And out of respect, he introduces himself in English. It's like, man, I'm going to really make a good impression. I'm going to introduce myself in English to Jeremy and his wife and their family. After the pastor finished talking with my dad, my dad turns and looks at me and says, what did he say? And the pastor's right there. So I'm in the middle of this triangle of awkwardness. Um, and I have to respond and say, he's talking to you in English. Um, and then I responded back to the pastor in Tok Pisan. Um, 
My parents have an ear for English. They've traveled internationally. But being able to listen to a person speak English and be able to get beyond their accent and their word order and how they say it, is a, it's cumbersome. It's difficult. And being able to grasp talk pisin allows you to be able to understand the English that is spoken in Papua New Guinea. So where does evangelism and where does church planting fit into all this? So for ministry in town, talk pisin is the language of choice. And English is... Uh, with very limited scope. Our family decided to be a part of an evangelical brotherhood church called EBC for the duration of our time in Medang. And as we first got there as a team, everybody traveled around and went to different churches. Remember the Cans went to a couple different churches, the Dodds went to a couple, uh, and then for us we went to a few as well. And there was a variety of churches, a variety of interesting teaching, um, and a variety of body life that we experienced. We landed at EBC because it was a small church of about 60 people. Preaching is guided by working through each titled section within a particular book of the Bible. And after singing an opening prayer and open mic for people to share anything God is teaching them, they will read the passage being taught that morning and then preach through it. Now, I will not say that the sermons were always exegetical or that the bullet points were derived from the text, but... I will say when you talked with members of that church body, they loved the Lord. They knew that Jesus' death on the cross was enough or enough or sufficient to be able to pay for their sin. They understood that faith in Christ brought them peace with God, and there was genuine joy in their words. Their faces glue and lit up when they talked about the Lord and how he had saved them. I remember taking one of our pastors out to lunch. Uh, at a simple restaurant in Medang. And after I ordered the food, which cost about $18 for both of us, he quietly whispered to me at the restaurant and said, Jeremiah, this food seems really expensive. I, he asked me if I had enough money to pay for the food, to which I said, yes. And then he told me about how the Lord had saved him. His entire family is Catholic. Now, what I mean by that is that in the past, a Catholic mission had come to their village, built a building, and people participate in weekly mass. They embrace both what they hear in their Sunday gatherings as well as their animistic belief system. After telling me about his upbringing, he then proceeds to tell me how he had been saved after hearing the gospel preached at a church during his later school years. He told me he was regularly burdened because he knows his family does not know Christ. He told me he knows there's no hope for them if they don't tiny bell, if they don't repent, if they don't believe in Jesus Christ alone. He knows what the gospel is, and he knows what the gospel is not. Here's a brother in Christ who heard the gospel in the shared trade language of Tokpisan and believed it. There were a handful of times that I had the privilege of speaking Sunday morning at that EBC church. There were two events where I preached in English. Now, the reason for this came out of a desire to provide university students in Medang with another outlet for English teaching exposure. What I came to realize very quickly is that American English is not Australian English, and it also does not follow the pattern of words that Talk Pisson does. As soon as I was wrapped up with teaching in English, they would come and thank me for teaching, which they would also say, it was really hard to understand with your accent. To which I'm thinking, how in the world was that encouraging? From that point on, I only conversed, prayed, and preached in Talk Pisan. Uh, with the book Bible open, reading from it, explaining it, I knew there would be greater clarity there compared to English. I became convinced that teaching and preaching in Talk Pisan is essential for effective ministry in Medang. Now, another obstacle shared related to discipleship in Talk Pisan is literacy. Frankly, this is an issue that relates not only to ministry in Medang Town, but also to ministry anywhere in Papua New Guinea. If you were going to sit down, I'll just ask, if you were going to sit down with an individual and you were going to read the Bible with them and explain the gospel to them, how would you do that? You're probably thinking through, well, maybe I'd walk them through the book of Romans. Maybe I'd take them through multiple sections in Romans. I need to build an argument or a case for who God is. They need to know who God is and who they are. They need to understand that they're accountable to the Lord. They need to understand the reason for Christ. 
Something you probably wouldn't ask yourself is, does he know how to read? It probably wouldn't even be a thought that's on your mind. You'd sit down with the assumption that the Bible would be open, you both would read through it, and you'd be able to work through something and come to clarity. Over the first two years in P&G, our family and the initial team to P&G had gone through many transitions. One thing that um, we'd noticed after things calmed down is I began to have Bible studies with the guards at our Medang base. I thought it'd be a great opportunity to communicate the gospel to them as best I could and talk pissing. Now, it'd be good to know that I observed for two years leading up to the start of these Bible studies. Every morning while I was making coffee, I had observed our head of security with his Bible open in his hands, and he would later read the newspaper. So when the time came to study, we began in the book of Romans, and he began reading from the first chapter when I realized his reading speed was far too slow for comprehension. He was not able to have any comprehension. Verse by verse, sentence by sentence was all he could carry on in terms of comprehension. From there, I asked him to read other materials, and he was able to track again with a single sentence, but unable to link sentences and thoughts together to grasp the context. He had been relying on the pictures in his Bible, combined with headings above those pictures to enjoy his reading, and whatever reading was for him. His understanding was that of a young child with a picture book in front of him, and this is a man that is nearly 40 years old. After observing my friend for two years, I had informed my observation with the assumption of reading comprehension. My friend was not able to read God's word with me, and at this point, he simply needed to hear the gospel from me, and he needed to be in a literacy program. From that point on, we had regular conversations about the gospel and started working through literacy in Tokpisan. After a few months, he was able to start reading with some improvement. Summing up, as our time comes to a close, um, there is just a need for more laborers in Papua New Guinea. There's a need for people to learn the shared language of Tokpisan and take up ministry in Medang Town. There's a need for individuals to learn not only the shared language of Tokpisan, but then go beyond that to learn one of the native languages that we find in the Finister Mountains in order to do church planting amongst a remote people. There was a need for individuals like Paul, individuals who spoke multiple languages, and God used in a major way to bring the saving message of Christ to those that have never heard it. I figure this is a great quote by David Livingston. It says, if a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? I'm going to read a section out of a book just to close up our time. But prior to that, I just want to work through some prayer points for you guys to be thinking about. The first would be Brian and Kira Twombly. Uh, They are planning to be out here in Arizona in August. And they are planning to go to Papua New Guinea to be in Medang Town. Uh, There's a desire to see the town of the Medang, town of the Medang, see the town of Medang, um, have church strengthening happening church planting happening. We want to see uh, literacy and translation resources happening in Medang. There's a need for logistical support to be happening in Medang, and there, Lord willing, is a need to have a seminary or a training center that also is in Medang. And part of that requires that we have a team that is consistently in Medang able to be a firm anchor for all of our missionaries that will be in the Finister Mountains of Papua New Guinea, the Cans and the Mitchells, or the family that we have there now, and Lord willing, more to come. But the Twombleys are the first family that the Lord has marked out that are going to be pursuing those things. And so in August, they will be here in Arizona, interacting with Grace Bible Church. They'll be here for a duration of time. Be praying for the Twombleys as they're preparing for that. And I would encourage all of you to spend time with the Twombleys when they are here. Uh, get to know them. They've got three sweet little kiddos that are a lot of fun to spend time with. They are both a joy to spend time with. And so I would ask for you guys to be praying for them. I would also ask for you guys to be praying for the Mitchells, uh, who are still presently in uh, Maui Roro, as well as our security guards that are keeping an eye on our base in Medang, uh, Saken Tep and Peter Luce. Uh, those are two guys that are there presently. Um, we have known the guys that work security and handle 
uh, maintenance at our property for something like eight years now. Uh, these are Papua New Guineans that you guys have never met, and yet they play a tremendous role in keeping things running organizationally for us in the country. And so I would ask for you guys to be praying for those things too. I'm going to read a section to close our time and pray after. Um, out of a book by a guy named Aaron Luce, who was a missionary with New Tribes Mission. After their ministry in Papua New Guinea, or during their ministry of church planting, having worked through chronological Bible teaching, there was a man that was pivotal in the work of helping with translation. His name was Blaze. And Blaze was an individual that once the chronological Bible teaching actually began to, to move forward within the village, uh, he never came forward in saving faith. He didn't believe the message, none of those things. And so Aaron found himself regularly praying for this man. And after a duration of time, he finally came to saving faith in Christ. And he was a new man. Individuals who knew him previously understood that he was a new individual. There was a transformed life that matched a profession of faith in Christ. And then he got cancer. And then family members and individuals began to question whether the message was a saving message, yet his firm was solid and sure and good. And so at the close of his life, Aaron is interacting with him, and he asks him to tell this message. It says this, Aaron says, he asked that they pray for his family members who were still not saved and needed to hear the gospel. He also asked me to tell them to send more missionaries. He explained, and this is him quoting Blaze, who is now with the Lord. So from the time I was a little boy until he became a man, I tried to follow all the rules to make God happy. But now I see that I was fooled. I was afraid to die then because I didn't know what would happen to me. Then the missionaries came and learned our language. They taught us, and I finally understood the plan of God and what he had for the road back to him. It was the work of Jesus. I'm sitting down safe in him. My body is wanting to die, but I am happy because I can't be taken away from God. It says he continued resting a bit between each sentence. We have the truth now in our talk, but there are other tribes in Papua New Guinea that don't. They don't know the road. They don't have it in their talk. They don't have missionaries like we do. Tell them to send more missionaries so that those people can hear the message and go to heaven where I am going soon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, this work is absolutely beyond us. Lord, the logistical needs that exist in order to send individuals to the other end of the world are vast. The languages in Papua New Guinea and the context in which you have created Papua New Guinea being so diverse and unique slows down from our perspective the process of being able to do effective church planting in the country. Individuals there are in desperate need of hearing the gospel with clarity and the confusion of churches and preaching and teaching that exists in Papua New Guinea. Now we pray you would raise up individuals that would desire to go, not as a sacrifice, but as a great honor of a commissioned heavenly king. I pray, God, that you would give us a heart for the people of Papua New Guinea, a heart for missions in general. Lord, not only here locally with individuals who we interact with, but Lord, globally sending people to Papua New Guinea to bring that life-saving message. Thank you for your word, and thank you for the individuals that brought the clarity of the gospel to each one of us. Lord, had we not heard the gospel, we still would be lost in our sin, separated from you. I pray, Lord, that you would be with our time now as we dismiss and then move into main service. Lord, encourage our hearts, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.